So uh, good evening, folks, to our um, community equity audit presentation. My name is Sandy Cooler. I am the town manager. And um, the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, read our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, a tribe of indigenous people from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. Um, so Arlington is engaged uh, on this equity audit. It is uh, part of a lot of things we've been doing in town recently around uh, equity and uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, training and understanding and conversations. Uh, I say conversations because uh, this is a journey for us. Uh, it, tonight is a sort of milestone, an important milestone. This is a very important equity audit that was done, uh, taking a lot of time to engage with uh, citizens here in town uh, and then making a set of, I think, thoughtful and important recommendations. Um, for Arlington, um, we've been directly involved in DEI uh, for several years. We were one of the first communities in the state to hire a DEI director, who I'll introduce in a second. Um, but for Arlington, I think these issues are and have been important for a long time. I was really struck um, by our Martin Luther King Day celebration uh, this year, first time I had been to one here in Arlington to find out it was the 35th anniversary of that celebration and that this has been happening for a long time with a really impressive list of speakers and attendees over that time. So uh, with that, um, I am going to uh, introduce Jill Harvey, who is our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director. Um, uh, and she is then going to lead the rest of the program. Jill? Okay, thanks. Um, I tried to move forward so people could see what was going on we were working on tech. Um, I'm Jill Harvey, the Diversity Equity Division, Division Director. Um, so yeah, thanks, Sandy, for those opening remarks. Um, I'm really excited that we are wrapping up this project. It's been a long journey that we started around this time last year um, with the support and endorsement of our select board and the fact that we found opportunities that like, wasn't dealt with us. Um, but I'm really excited for these findings and recommendations to be shared with our community so we can really start to make some steps to make Remington a more equitable place. Um, so I'm going to just kick it over to Yasmin Gordon, who's our project director with Opportunity Consulting. Thanks, Jill. And um, so, hi everyone, I'm Yasmin Gordon. I am the director of Equity, Inclusion, and Culture for Opportunity Consulting, and I have been the project lead um, for the entire Community Equity Audit Project here in Arlington. I have on the screen as well over um, to y'all's right, um, my colleague who will introduce and kind of kick us off uh, for the start, give you a little bit of background about Opportunity, opportunity Consulting, and then I will take over and talk about the findings and the recommendations. All right, great. Can everyone hear me? <clears throat> All right. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Iris Bond Gill, and I'm CEO of Opportunity Consulting. And I um, thank you for the introduction, Yasmin. I'm very um, excited. I had every intention of being there in person, and unfortunately, COVID got the best of me. Um, so I am homebound instead, but very thankful that the team offered so that I could still be here with you all virtually. <clears throat> um, and as Jillian mentioned, our firm conducted this community equity audit for the town of Arlington. Um, we're excited, as I said, to present tonight the findings and the recommendations from this work. Um, and so thank you for having us here. Thank you for this opportunity. We'll take some time to walk through uh, a highlight of- uh, Yes. Sorry, excuse me, we just had a little bit of- <laughs> A little bit of an interruption here from Sandy, who we are from who needs to introduce this as a forum or as a select board meeting because we do have a forum online. Oh, so, 
Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, so <coughs> we need to allow Len Diggins, the chair of the select board, to officially call this to order as a uh, board meeting. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Jill, I don't know how we, if, who would promote uh, Len so that he can Ashley is on. Okay, yeah. Ashley, can you promote Len on the screen? Yes, Len's a panelist now. Len, uh, Mr. Dickens, you can go right ahead. Oh, thank you. I mean, um, it's not about my ego. It's just about keeping us all out of jail because of open meeting law. So, so I have to read through this because it's the law. <laughs> so, so, I, so welcome. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, February 13th. 2023, also known as the day before Valentine's Day. I am Select Board Chair Leonard Diggins, and I will now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. Yes, Mr. Chair, and it's Valentine's Day. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I, I stand you know, uh, uh, um, Eric Helmus? Yes. And Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Kohler? Here. Uh, and um, Ashley Meyer? Here. Thank you. Nice meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, signing the law on July 17, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation until March 31st, 2023. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the tablet's website using the notice agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. So OML requires that when a meeting in which a quorum of select board members is gathered for discussion, then that meeting must be recognized as a formal meeting of the select board. This will be the case until this meeting ends or until one of my two colleagues in the case that he or she will part the meeting. At that point, I will take a motion to adjourn the select board meeting. After the adjournment of the select board meeting, however, this forum may continue. So I'll now return the meeting uh, into the hands of, of Ms. Harvey or whomever was um, leading the discussion. Uh, and if necessary, I'll chime in to acknowledge any questions from, from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins, um, and greetings to this evening to members of the select board. Um, um, I, I'm trying to remember where I was. Uh, so we are going to, as I was saying, walk through some findings and recommendations tonight from this equity audit. And I did just want to say that um, we do this work around the country. This is really a core part of our work, uh, both doing equity audits, uh, working with stakeholders and communities, and uh, doing strategic planning as well. Um, and I wanna just say, this takes a lot of courage to be a community that invites outsiders in uh, to say, come and take a look at the work that we're doing and, and tell us how we might be able to do this better and in a more equitable way. And so uh, we just wanna name that, that this is a, a town that has really shown that commitment to equity, both uh, in the work that you've commissioned and also in the work that you've done with us as partners throughout this journey. So thank you for that. <clears throat> You can move to the next slide. <clears throat> um, so just to give a little overview of this, uh, we kicked off this work, I think in April or May, uh, to really start to explore the town's impact on resident life and to discover how uh, the town might be able to be more equitable in uh, relationships with the community. And we specifically looked in three areas and that's housing, residents' experiences with town workforce and civic participation. And in designing a project that looks across three areas like this, it really allows us to uh, see it from the perspective of the community members who experience these services, 
versus seeing it from inside a system where it may be siloed in bureaucracies. And so our goal was really to think about how does how did these three issue areas and these three service areas really impact individuals who live in the town and experience it every day. <clears throat> Next slide. All right, um, a little bit about us. Opportunity Consulting is based in Washington, DC. We've been around since 2012. Uh, we work with cities, school districts, and other public serving organizations around the country to help improve outcomes for those who are most marginalized in our systems and institutions. As I mentioned earlier, a core part of our work is conducting equity audits um, in a number of public policy issues, education, housing, workforce. Um, and so this work with Arlington <coughs> near and dear to us, but also a core part of the work that we do as a company. Uh, the presentation tonight is high level. It will be an opportunity to sort of provide you all with some highlights and some of the bigger themes. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was also provide you with some QR codes that could take you to much more detailed information um, that will allow you to go more in depth with the work that we're talking about tonight. So on the left-hand side is a summary report. And I would actually encourage you all to take a look at the QR code on the right-hand side, which is the full report that will give you context to tonight's discussion um, and also provide for you the finer details around um, the findings and the recommendations. Can we get folks in the room using the QR code? Take you your phone and just um, click on, on the picture and uh, pull it up that way if you'd like. <clears throat> Save it. Okay. All right. Here we go. <laughs> um, okay. So a few points about... Uh, about the audit and our approach to the audit. Um, before we talk about that, I think one, one area that we really wanna be able to highlight for you all today is that um, this community equity audit is probably different from some other audits that you've seen where um, people go in and sort of open up your books and immediately start looking at the policies and the practices. And what we do is we really approach this from the perspective of looking at outcomes and, and what those tell us. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then also having a robust stakeholder engagement experience, which is where we will use that information in the perspective of community members to determine where to dive more deeply. And then that's what will guide us into the rest of the audit. And so this was, um, this was kind of the approach that we took here as well. Um, just a few other points. Uh, we know that research shows that people are motivated to participate in, um, in, in their town when they connect with the cultural identity and they feel like they belong. And so that was another sort of guiding principle about how we approach to this. And then finally, sometimes people say, why, why are you starting with race? And much of our approach leads with race because we recognize that uh, the creation and the perpetuation of racial inequities is really in many ways baked into the fabric of the country. And that by identifying what those areas, those gaps, those um, ways to improve and provide more equity and dismantle some of those systems. We know that other marginalized communities, whether it's gender and sexual orientation and ability, will also benefit. And so that is why for us, in many ways, that is just a starting place. Oh, you cut out there, Iris. Oh, next slide. This is the, oh, okay. thank you. <laughs> so this is really uh, how we went about getting the findings and this is our methodology. So um, how we went about this, as I was talking to you, we really start with outcomes and the outcomes are what ground us in where we find gaps and areas where inequities show up in the town. Um, and in doing that, we looked at uh, publicly available data, um, either through the census. We also looked at data collected by the town. So there's there's a lot of data that the town collects and they were gracious enough to allow us to look at that data and do a lot of analysis on it. We produce both maps, charts, graphs, things like that that you'll see in the report. Um, and also past survey data that the town had. Um, from there, once we identified what some of those gaps were, it allowed us to really think about how we wanted to engage the town around those areas. Uh, and so we brought together um, town members in uh, focus groups. We did four focus groups. 
we held about 30 individual interviews with residents, with individuals who um, work at community-based organizations that really gave us a lot of context uh, for what we were learning and what we were seeing, as well as town leaders and other stakeholders in the community. Um, and then from there, we looked at the reports that the town has. We identified some policies and practices that are in place that really uh, kind of fed into what we were hearing from the town residents. Um, and then with that information, using both uh, the data that we saw, the stakeholder engagement and the, the feedback that we heard from residents um, and from the review of the policies and practices, we then developed out what the findings are, which we'll hear more about. And before I turn it over to Yasmin, who's going to walk through those findings, we just wanted to give a special shout out to the lead team community members um, who came together, I think there were eight of them, and really guided our practice and assisted us with this audit from the beginning to the end. Um, these residents gave their time, energy, perspective, and commitment to the project. Also, all of the residents that engaged with us, we also provided a survey. We had people take the survey, and so the survey instrument provided a lot of information for us to dig in more deeply as well. And so we just appreciate all of the contributions that the city uh, and the town made uh, to this project. Um, and certainly the project team there who is hosting tonight, we thank you for your time and your partnership around this. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, you know, we really want to make sure that we thank Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to have to lean over a little bit as I do this, I think. Um, if folks in the back are not able to hear me, please feel free to uh, just, you know, raise your hand or something so I can lean a little bit closer. So I'm going to dig right in, um, knowing that we do have, you know, some time constraints tonight. And I'm just going to um, read through each of the findings. I'm going to elaborate on a couple of findings. Um, and then if you need more information or if you'd like to kind of see how we got to some of the findings, like Iris had said, they are available in the two different types of reports that we, uh, that we shared with you earlier. So the first finding that we found is that public participation opportunities things like joining commissions, things even like um, being able to engage in town events um, and participation on a select board and town meeting, those opportunities are not truly designed to be accessible to diverse residents. Um, and we found that because we looked at a lot of demographics around who makes up those groups and they're very, um, they're, they are very much uh, kind of heavy to one side of one particular demographic. Um, and are very, they're, they're not very diverse whatsoever. Um, and I think that I see a lot of kids shaking in the room. So that's not really a surprise to a lot of people in our community. Finding number two is that town events are not really available for residents to form true connections and relationships. Arlington does have quite a few town events that they you know, promote throughout the year. However, once again, when you think about inclusive design, um, we determined that there isn't a whole lot of inclusive design that goes into the structure of those events and that there, it actually does kind of create some barriers for particular members of the community that are not able to access those events. Finding number three is that town officials and town leaders do not make the time really to get to know the most diverse residents in the town. Um, residents spoke a lot to not having relationships and not even really knowing who the folks are that sit in leadership positions within the town. And that, you know, said to us that there's quite a disconnect between folks, particularly in marginalized communities in the, you know, within, uh, within the town, not really feeling connected to the people who are making decisions about their daily lives and the decisions that impact their daily lives. Finding number four is that diverse residents don't trust that the town is meeting their needs. Um, that was something that was particularly loud and clear during our stakeholder engagement process. And we get into a little bit more of that in the report. You know, we talk about in the feeling of inclusion and belonging. We talk about the importance of representation. Um, and when people can see themselves in leadership, when people can see themselves in positions of power, it encourages them to be more involved and encourages them and it gives them a feeling of uh, a sense of inclusion and a sense of this is for me. Um, we are not finding a lot of that in the town of Arlington, and that was definitely something that we heard loud and clear through our stakeholder engagement process. Finding number five 
is that Black, Indigenous, and people of color who live in Arlington are not seeing themselves as potential employees in the town workforce. One of the town's um, DEI goals is to diversify their workforce across the board. And um, once again, it's a very homogenous uh, workforce. We have some evidence in the report that shows um, just quite what the disparities are. And it's, you know, I think it was less than 2% uh, people who work for the town are people who identify as black and indigenous people of color, which means everyone else is white. Right. Um, and so that's a, quite a heavy imbalance. And without, you know, without representation within the town, it might, um, folks, folks have a hard time seeing themselves working in the town. But, you know, I would like to see more of a place where people like me are in positions of power or in leadership. Um, and that will encourage, if, if the town is successful in diversity, that will actually continue to encourage more and more people, even from areas outside of Arlington, to come in and want to be a part of that workforce. Finding number six is that Black and Indigenous people of color residents have a negative view of the town as a workplace. Um, and that is due to a number of reasons, which we, I will you know, talk about a little bit further in the recommendations. But once again, that lack of representation makes it hard for people to envision themselves as being successful in the workplace. And then folks start to ask questions about, you know, what's it like for a person like me to work for the town of Arlington? And if there's nobody there, those questions don't get answered. Um, so we did hear a lot of that from residents as well. This is just a little pause to talk a little bit and to pull some quotes that we got um, from our stakeholder engagement process. As Iris was explaining, that there was a lot, very robust community-based um, efforts to get out and talk to the folks in the community that are not heard of in, within the town workers, people who have never had a seat at the table, people who don't have the opportunity to show up to public meetings. Um, we really, I, you know, we, we came to Arlington on multiple occasions and made connections with people from different communities, and we were able to you know, speak to, uh, um, we, were, we were able to host even a focus group in the language of Mandarin for an entire group of Mandarin speakers who have never had the opportunity to provide feedback to the town because they don't speak the language. Um, and so these are just some pull quotes from resident experiences talking about, um, you know, the town, you know, tries to recognize indigenous people, but what it, seems like to the very few indigenous people who live here in town is that really it's colonizers just kind of giving each other a pat on the back with no actual indigenous leadership. So there's that, you know, that it, it calls into it calls into question what leadership looks like. It calls into question making those connections with marginalized communities. Um, some other folks talked about, um, you know, people thinking and making the assumption that all black and brown people are liberals. And that came up in our, you know, in our discussions with the community that it's not all that, that all black and brown people have the same political views. And people say that we're saying that they, as in the town and other, you know, other organizations that are, are working to try to help diversify town leadership, they think that just because we're black, our views should be the same as theirs. But black Republicans have the right to exist and have their voices heard just as much as white Democrats, and they all experience the same racism. I thought that was a really powerful quote to put in because when you're thinking about you know, diversity, when you're thinking about inclusion, you really need to keep in mind that it's all groups and all perspectives that should be at the table. And then the third quote that we have here um, is that it's clear that many town leaders and homeowners feel that renters are not as important as owners. And this particular person um, said that they have lived here, contributed in many ways. They feel, though, like they're expendable members of the community because they rent. And that was another message that we heard loud and clear from the resident communities that we were speaking to, was that renters pretty much feel ignored by the town because most of the policy and all of the driving factor in housing is really you know, geared towards homeowners or um, di dictated by home. And so that was something that absolutely came to life throughout the process. In finding number seven, we found that white employees of the town make more than non-white employees. And that was a disparity that is illuminated and illustrated in 
the uh, in the full report, um, there is a chart that explains and it shows that there's quite a level of uh, disparity between what white employees make and all other categories of race. But the largest disparity was between white employees and people who identify as black. Finding number eight is that the civil service membership of the public safety departments is actually preventing the hiring of diverse public safety staff and officers. Um, a lot of people might not understand what that means, and I wanted to elaborate that on that just a little bit. Um, civil service membership is like a job category for the public safety department, so for police and fire within the town of Arlington. And being a member of the civil service, there is um, a priority that is placed on those departments to prioritize the hiring of staff for people who live in the town of Arlington. And so it's telling people that you have to give the jobs first to the people who live in the town of Arlington before you can go and look outside for other employees. And the reason why that is a barrier to diversification is because the town of Arlington itself is extremely homogenous. And we talked about this at the beginning. There are very few people of color who live in the town of Arlington, yet the town as, it, as a whole is trying to diversify and that includes the public safety departments. Um, so having that clause, having that rule that folks who live in Arlington get first priority to be a police officer or to be a firefighter or to be an emergency services officer um, is a direct barrier to, to the, you know, the chiefs and the leaders actually being able to diversify their workforce. If the town of Arlington was able to remove itself from the, from the civil service category, then they would be able to more widely um, recruit from neighboring areas that are much more diverse. You know, towns literally that border um, Arlington, and that in turn could also increase people coming into the town and the town diversification overall with uh, folks on jobs that can actually work here and might, end up, might encourage them to move here. Finding number nine, um, we found that the town of Arlington is in fact racially segregated, which restricts housing options for black and indigenous people of color residents. So I'm sure that everyone who is watching this knows about the difference between East Arlington and West Arlington. Um, that was something that we heard loud and clear from day one as we started um, looking into kind of what are people's experiences. I think, you know, I came and I walked. <laughs> literally walked with uh, with a couple of folks from here down Massachusetts Ave. And even as I was walking myself, I saw a difference about a quarter mile down from here. Um, and I started to see a much more diverse culture. I started to see different storefronts. I started to see and feel a different energy than when I was walking in different neighborhoods that were on the other side of our um, So that's definitely something that we heard from people in the town as well. People, um, you know, for Black and Indigenous people of color, feeling like East Arlington really was the place for them. Feeling like there wasn't a whole lot uh, within the other places in town to offer them. Uh, and feeling more comfortable in, in the spaces where they were seeing more people who look like them. You know, who look like yourself from, that, from your own community. Uh, it gives you a feeling of comfort, it gives you a feeling of home. And because of that, there tends to be a lot of pumping that happens when there are, when there's housing, when people are spending their money, when people are engaging in social activities, tends to tends to be segregated into one particular area. There are other pockets that you'll see um, that we uh, mapped out in, in the report. There are just a couple of other pockets that are very much um, confined to areas where the Arlington Housing Authority has their properties. Um, the two the two housing <laughs> um, and so that also, you know, looks when we look at housing segregation, we think about affordability. Um, and when we are thinking about the, the people who can afford or who are who have low income or even middle to low income, only being able to rent in the town of Arlington, not being afford, uh, not being able to afford property um, or, or houses or homes, single family homes inside Arlington, that contributes to that segregation. I'll get into that a little bit more in the recommendations when we talk about housing. Finding number 10, and the final finding is that we talked about renters feeling unsupported by the town. 
um, really very little to no policy that is being developed to support ventures, um, current and, and past. I know that there have been some great efforts by the town of recent, um, you know, there was a recent study that went out. There is the housing action plan, which is a great step forward. Um, but that is still something that is being felt by the community as a whole. I'm going to move forward. I just have a little reminder that, you know, research has shown that residential diversity actually improves individual and collective quality of life for people of all racial and ethnic backgrounds, income and ability levels. It, it improves it both in the short term and in the long term. And there's actually a lot of research out there that actually ties that to also to economic opportunity within the town. Where are people spending their money, right? If you think about that, um, there's, there's a lot of research that connects the two. So that's just a little reminder. So what are these findings telling us? Really, right? So we came in, we looked at data, we talked to people. So what, right? Um, these findings truly are the amplification of the voices and tell the story of the most marginalized folks in our region. Those were the folks that we were really trying to get to to find out what's your experience and how does it differ from the people who always have the opportunity to come forth and tell, talk about their experiences. They help us to understand what ways people's experiences are different and who benefits the most from the current services and current practices of the town. Um, we absolutely found that folks' experiences in Arlington, not unlike any other um, town or city in the United States at the moment um, and throughout, you know, throughout history, people's experiences are unequal. And so the town has a responsibility to try to mitigate those circumstances, they, to try to reduce those barriers, to try to increased opportunity for the folks who have none. Um, and that's really what these recommendations that I'm about to go through um, give the town of Arlington an opportunity to do some things that are actionable to try to change those outcomes for the most marginalized. So we're diving into the recommendations now. And the first one that we um, absolutely think that the town should engage in is to establish a community engagement team that can work to make meaningful connections with residents who have experienced inequality in the town of Arlington. Inclusion and belonging is absolutely paramount in being able to increase opportunities of civic engagement, um, which then leads to policy change and further further on down the line. Um, they can give folks from marginalized communities much needed support um, and they build connections and continue, they can continue to identify and address local needs. And so that's the wonderful thing that research has shown around towns and cities who establish a team like this, is really it's a, it's a funnel for two-way information. So not only is it an opportunity for the town to give residents who don't have the opportunity to, or don't have access to information, that information that they need, but also for the town to learn about what the needs are of those communities so that they can address them on a more regular and ongoing basis. There's a lot of research out there um, that actually shows that this is one of the number one strategies to increase community engagement. Recommendation number two is to develop a town-wide system for ongoing information gathering and communication. And so the town does, a, you know, every, every town in, in the United States and the town of Arlington does a pretty good job of putting information out there. There is definitely a missing piece of getting information. And so the community engagement team is an opportunity to, to increase that. However, there are other things that the town can be doing. For instance, um, you know, at the town of Arlington puts out a, a community survey every year. We heard from the community that that's not enough and it doesn't ask the right questions, right? So they were, you know, the questions are based on what the town leadership think the needs are in the community, but there's definitely a disconnect between what those thoughts are, what those assumptions are, and what the actual um, what are the actual needs of the community? So establishing something that is more um, regular and more ongoing, for instance, um, you know, holding community listening sessions on a regular basis in targeted areas of the community where you're not finding, you're getting a lot of information. That is something that a community engagement team could help facilitate that would funnel information back to town leadership on an ongoing basis. Um, recommendation number three is to establish a fair election and voting access plan. And what that, the purpose of a plan like that is to do is 
to allow for every member or every eligible resident who can vote in either a town election or a federal election to have equal access to that opportunity. We did find that there were a lot of residents who were feeling disenfranchised because of a lot of information um, that was just very unclear um, around polling locations and how to vote and if the town of Arlington has mail-in voting or not and who elect their elected officials are and things like that. Um, and these, you know that, that can happen, especially for newcomers who are coming into a town who may be voting for the first time. So really the town of Arlington can create a plan to establish kind of universal rules and universal practice around you know, elections and voting, around commission appointments, around how commission, open commission seats are communicated to the public so that if anybody does want to or wants to choose to run for one of those positions, they know when and how to do so. Um, right now, a lot of the information for those particular seats of like commission appointments is we, we found that is done through, is conducted through word of mouth. Um, and so when you think about how much power and privilege there is in the word of mouth system, you think about how many people are being left out of that who don't have the connections to hear what the word of mouth actually is. So if there was something that was a universal practice to make sure that all, you know, all residents have the opportunity to know what those appointments are coming up with, um, that would make it, that would make things more equitable. Recommendation number four is to invest in a language and communication access um, policy and plan. And that is something that um, Jillian and her team are actually already um, working on. And it's something that we absolutely found is a need to. There are uh, many different languages that are spoken in the town of Arlington. A lot of people might not know that. Um, there are folks who are non-traditional English speakers, meaning there are folks who have limited English proficiency, whether that means they come from the middle of the community or they come from a community that is English as a second language. Um, accessing written only information can be really difficult for a lot of folks. Uh, and you know that that goes from voting information all the way to advertising for community events that they could partake in and how those events are actually set up. Um, and how we think about how people need to have different means for engagement. Um, those are all things that can be included in a language and information access plan to really think about all of those different communities that are affected by written only language, by a written only communication system, which is what the town of Arlington has covered. Um, number five is to establish an equity dashboard that's reviewed quarterly by town leadership. An equity dashboard is um, really, it's a way to collect data around people's experiences and outcomes versus people as numbers. Um, and it really seeks to look at and provide insight into the impact of all of these initiatives that the town is looking to implement in the next few years in the DPI strategy. Um, analyzing those types of metrics can absolutely measure progress, how well the city is doing. It can also measure progress in the impact of what those systems, those newly developed systems are on the community. And um, it can be used for accountability and improvement in the town too. Number six is for the town to leverage local universities and community groups to establish relationships specifically for recruitment. One of the things that we saw was missing in uh, town workforce development. If a town is looking to diversify, um, they need to get a little creative in the ways that they are looking to, to recruit members from marginalized communities. And really it's about making those connections. You have many institutions that lie literally on your doorstep. And those, if you establish recruitment relationships with those institutions, you can create pipelines and pathways for people who are recent graduates to enter directly into the town workforce, um, especially in many of the universities and colleges that are in Cambridge, right over there, um, right next door, who also has a much higher rate of Black and Indigenous people of color um, residents and, and college students um, within those institutions. That is another research based um, recommendation that a lot of towns are implementing across the nation and has been quite successful. Number seven is to allow the public safety departments to exit from civil service. We talked a little bit about that before. 
um, number eight, is to address the income inequality that currently exists in the town workforce. We talked about that pay disparity to actually conduct a pay equity audit. And so that's a little bit different from the type of audit that we just conducted, where it really hones in on the pay structure and how, um, and the appointment structure positions, it really looks at um, the types of positions that are available and how people can actually rise from, you know, entry level positions into leadership positions as well. So it's definitely something that we would suggest the town take a deeper, deeper look at. Number nine is that the town continue the diversity, equity, and inclusion training that is has been ongoing um, with a little bit of a shift now um, towards more cultural responsiveness. So typically, um, you know, once once folks have universal language, once people understand the importance of inclusion and belonging um, within a town, really now it can be time to focus on what are the different cultural connections that folks need to understand what are the different cultural differences that folks who are serving a multicultural um, town need to know when they're engaging with residents that will absolutely boost and improve the services that we want. Numbers 10, 11, and 12. Number 10 is to establish and hire a housing specialist or a housing liaison position. Um, this is also something that we have seen be extremely successful across cities and towns. Um, we did an equity audit for a town up in Vermont, um, or for a city up in Vermont that is now, um, they just approved in their, in their budget to actually hire a, a liaison position because there was so much that was happening um, in the community with between landlords and illegal practices from landlords and from renters not knowing kind of how to navigate systems. Um, and so if you, the town were to, were to establish a position like housing specialist or a housing liaison, that person would kind of be the conduit and the, the, um, the one-stop shop for people who need, <laughs> who need support and who need to kind of be pointed in the right direction if it's something that's outside of the town's purview. Um, it has been extremely successful, like I said, in other, um, in other communities and it gives residents who rent specifically a place to go to to find all the types of supports that they might need. So it's not necessarily that the town itself is providing those supports, but at least providing the information for people to be able to get those supports in one place has been very successful. Number 11 is to develop a community fund for rental assistance and rental housing improvement programs um, and a centralized system for funding. This is where you actually could, the town could dive in and give landlords a bit of support as well. Um, a lot of folks or a lot of towns and cities have implemented such funding. I think the town of Arlington has also um, got like a housing fund or, uh, yeah, um, that they're working on, but focusing and trying to figure out how a piece of that fund can go to support renters and support relationships between landlords and renters can be really beneficial. Um, one of the towns that we worked in, uh, it decided to use their community center and on a monthly basis have, you know, have uh, their landlords come in, have renters come in, have people who are um, assisting like social workers and things like that all just use the space so that people can come in, ask questions, um, they're, you know, they utilize interpreters just so if there are people who are not English speaking, they can go and have on-site um, support and information. And that's all funded through the community funding. Number 12 and the last recommendation that we have is to stress the restrictive zoning districts to allow for desegregation. So a lot of folks um, here might know that the town of Arlington's um, current zoning policies, there's, there's, if you trace the history back to when they were first developed and how they were developed, it was actually through some pretty um, racist clauses that were, um, that were introduced into land covenants when a large section of the town was being sold off and separated into, I think it was 200 different parcels of land were being sold by a particular family who had quite a lot of power in this town. Um, sold all of those parcels of land and put land covenants in every single one of those parcels so that that land could not be owned or occupied even by people of color. Um, and because of that, those parcels were then 
bought or would have been sold um, to you know people who were affluent, people who were in the white community. They were able to build their single family houses on that. And those are the same districts that are zoned for single family housing today. Um, and so when you look at that history, um, that has not actually been addressed yet in the town, then you really need to examine what those zoning policies still mean and how they're actually perpetuating seg segregation here in the town. Arlington has done a, a great job of being able to kind of identify spaces outside of those districts to build low-income housing. There was a new, um, I believe, a new building that had gone up by one of the housing authorities in the last couple of years, um, which is wonderful. However, when we continue to build low-income housing in the same areas over and over again because of the restrictive zoning laws, then we are only perpetuating that same segregation. And so really it's about thinking about how, you, how the town of Arlington can introduce multifamily zoning districts within some of those parcels that have been the same types of parcels for many generations. So, what happens now? I think I was going to hand it back over to my colleague for this one um, to introduce um, some of the town staff to talk to everyone here around what the next steps are going to be. You know, we have these recommendations and findings. Absolutely. I'm sure you all are ready to engage and have questions. And, um, and I know that the town um, uh, project leads are going to also come up and address questions, particularly questions around what now, what next. Um, and one thing uh, I think we, we always want to say is that uh, there are many different entry points for a town to address issues of inequity in a school or in a system. And so uh, really the next steps we were thinking, and I know the town is really considering are around strategic planning and really coming up with this what are the actual steps that we're going to take? So we've got these 12 recommendations and within each recommendation, there will be steps that you will want to take. But you may have a different starting point than another, another system. You may have particular opportunities that are coming up. You may be going through your budgets right now and really thinking about um, from a policy perspective, what, could, what changes could you make or where you could make additional investments. And so we would encourage you uh, to think about those kinds of opportunities that may exist so not just starting with one place, they're you know, really thinking about where in your system and within your context, do you have those kind of opportunities? So we wanted to just share that with you. And um, in particular, when we're thinking about that, we're really saying it is the town's responsibility to create the conditions for the residents to uh, engage, feel supported and have an opportunity to access all of the various components of city and, and town life. So with that, I wanna just stop. Everybody um, heard a lot tonight. Um, again, we would encourage you to take a look at the report for the finer details. You know, when we say things like, oh, there's segregation, we actually have maps that demonstrate that. When we say there are paid disparities, we have the charts and the graphs to demonstrate that. So uh, take a look at that report. But yeah, I'll turn it over um, back to you, Jillian, uh, and you can uh, moderate Q&A. Great, thanks for that presentation. Um, so we're going to open it up for some Q&A. I think we're going to move forward a little bit. So I, I don't know what people can see. Oh, they can see that. Um, so we're going to do questions kind of back and forth in the room and taking virtual ones as well. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take two questions from here live. Then Tim, I think you'll read two questions um, and you can announce who asked them. Um, and then we will do some answers. So, anyone eager? I feel like Hi. Hi. <laughs> single-family home ownership in the district and the redistricting. So it's almost 
all entirely rental property. So that may be going in the wrong direction. Uh, I had a number of comments. I don't. Um, first of all, the greatest inequity in this town is the teachers in the primary schools. There are almost no men teaching homerooms in the elementary schools. Male children do not have role models to then become teachers themselves in an elementary school. And so you have this perpetuation. And there also seems to be discrimination by these female teachers against male students. You see them favoring the female students. Um, as far as uh, uh, zoning regulations go, and some of the old covenants, I don't think that makes much of a difference these days, because they're not enforced. And there's no multi-generational homesteads that you find where a family will remain generation after generation on the same piece of property. So even if it had been racist and only limited to whites, the places have changed in hands, so it's it's not kept that way at all. And some of the properties in the town are not very desirable either. Uh, it tends to be in a flooding area, and uh, uh, it was probably better suited for agriculture as it started out. Uh, Mark, uh, did I you can open this up for questions? Usually, the question ends with a question mark. Oh, okay. So okay. if you have a question, great. Otherwise. Um, you know, appreciate your comments, but let's try to keep it going. Um, well, how do you see the uh, the town fixing the inequality in the schools and getting more male teachers? Funny you ask. Um, the schools actually conducted their own equity audit, so I believe that I believe that that's being worked on. That audit was completed at the end of last year, so that's also available to the public to read, review. I mean, I don't do hiring for schools, so um, that's definitely a school um, side discussion for the superintendent and school committee. Uh, Robin Bergman, uh, you recommended term limits for town meeting. The World Out Town Commission as your chairs. Uh, additionally, the town clerk is recommending changing that position to be appointed rather than elected. And how would this report impact the decision to give into recommendations on term limits and accessibility of the term positions? Could the question be repeated clearly? So I think there were two parts to that question. One was about uh, there being recommendations for term limits for various uh, boards, committees, town meeting, etc. Uh, and that, that sort of segued into the discussion about whether we would change our town clerk's position from one that is uh, now elected to one that would be appointed. Did I get those right? Yes. Okay. Um, so, first I have to say, um, I don't know. And I very specifically don't know because this is the beginning of a conversation about everything that's in this report. Jill and I have already talked about a, a strategic conversation that we'll have together over the next month to lay out priorities, to engage other people with them, and so forth. So there are recommendations in here. I'm not going to try to say tonight, yes, we're going to adopt everything or no, we're going to. We're going to look at converse about all the things in here. Um, I think the issue of uh, the town clerk being elected or, or appointed, that's going to be an interesting conversation in town meeting. That's where that conversation is going to happen. Um, and so I don't want to preempt that. Um, and frankly, as manager uh, tonight, I'm not taking a position on that issue either. Um, but uh, I do think those issues of things like term limits are worth having a discussion about because there are plenty of people on both sides of those issues thinking about what is a more democratic way to do things. 
And I think those are the kind of things that are coming out of this report that deserve conversation, engagement, and discussion. And that's what we're doing. Uh, Rajiv has asked, uh, not all the work that went into this by opportunity consultant and the DI department, does the report include the total number of people interviewed and their uh, ethnicity in this? Yeah, I can answer that one. The report does go into the numbers of the folks that we interviewed. So we interviewed 30 um, one on one, we, had, we held 30 one on one interviews. The respondents to the community survey were um, 126, and then we held four different focus groups where, I don't think that every number of focus groups, it's in the report, um, but I believe that there were roughly about 35 people who attended the four different focus groups. Um, and the community survey does have racial demographics that are broken down, and you can get that information from the town. questions from in here. How did you find the age of 30? How did we find them? Yeah. yeah, so um I actually traveled to Arlington four different times um, throughout this audit and literally went around shaking people's hands and forming connections um, with folks. The first engagement that I that I attended was the um, a national night out um, that happened over at one of the elementary schools. And really what it looked like was me walking up to people and talking to them and telling them who I was and what I did and asking them if they had an opinion on anything and if they wanted to, to get in touch with me. So I, I, I did a lot of handing out of business cards. Um, and then people did, people emailed me. Um, and then they referred me to other folks and other friends of theirs, you know, in the one-on-one -on -one conversations that and so that ended up, that was about an eight week process where, you know, we started um, in the summertime getting people and then it, uh, initially we were only thinking we would interview about 15 people, but so many people kept referring me to other people um, that I absolutely was really trying not to exclude folks from the conversation. And so I was just, uh, you know, taking anybody who wanted to talk at this point. And that actually happened all the way up through November. Um, I had some folks that were emailing me asking me to, to engage. And then the community survey was open for four weeks, a four-week period um, in over, started in November and it closed in December um, for people to engage that way as well. Any others? One more question, Donna, I need I thank you, Mark Kepline, recent nine. But the civil service exam um, and removing that, I, this, well, okay, the civil service membership. There is an exam for that. So that that provides a certain level of competency that's important in these uh, jobs that are interact with the public at a high level. Um, so I, and there, there's also favorship towards veterans, and the military is a very diverse organization. So you know, that's a positive thing. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure about that about removing the civil service uh, requirement. Because, you know that's that's true for senior members of the management, but uh, individual workers uh, there should be a certain level of competency. And I'm also concerned about adding more services. Uh, you talked about adding more services. For 10 years, I was a renter. My first 10 years, and I was unaware and uninvolved in politics. And the water flow, the trash got taken away. If called 911, people with great numbers came very quickly. So uh, I felt that all my needs were being met by the town. Is there a question there? Yeah, so uh, well, what do you think about the cost factor of adding more services, more jobs, and still keeping our affordable for lower income people? They can't wear it all. 
So I think uh, one of the things just we do with budgets all the time is that there's sort of a, there's way more need and demand for services than we have money at any one time. So we always are making choices about what our priorities are, and what we can add. I think the town has done a good job in the last few years of being able to add things like a DEI office and do that within the resources that we have. Um, I see you shrugging your shoulders. I would lift my hands and say, congratulations. Arlington's done a great job that way. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will continue to evaluate these different recommendations. Uh, I think there are many things in this report that are thought provoking, good suggestions, things that we will look at and discuss and see how we can fit in and what we can afford. And then we will start to make those recommendations. And ultimately, it's a democratic process. It's up to town meeting and to the voters uh, to decide what it is uh, that they'd like to see in their government. And that's what I think government is all about, being able to mediate priorities and uh, opportunities uh, to build the kind of town that you want to live in. Uh, any thoughts from you? Um, if not, I'm, I'm going to... Oh, go ahead. Uh, Bilal has asked... Uh, how do you... Yes. Uh, Fiorella has asked, how do we make sure to improve the elderly and people of color uh, get hired through the various and businesses they run? Repeat the question. Yes. How do we make sure diversity is included in the hiring of family owned businesses? So I say that it goes back to the first recommendation around engagement, and we don't as a town and as I say people, there's not a lot of um, engaging with other with folks that are other, other than you. And so for me, that question is really just talking to your neighbors, going into different businesses, stepping out of your comfort zone. And I think for us on the town side, that it also includes us providing some opportunities for engagement for folks to be able to come together. Um, I know we could do more programming with our Chamber of Commerce and get them involved, just making different um, connections and establishing relationships and relationships that are actually meaningful, not just, um, yeah, transactional. So I think that's something that's absolutely feasible. It's just going to take time. You can't build relationships overnight. So um, definitely something that we can do. <laughs> Uh, Christina has asked, uh, can you please tell us about the dissemination of the reports and plans? Uh, and also, they're wondering um, if there is a community engagement plan for in the report. Uh, the ones I had particularly given communications from the other organizations. So, to answer the second part of the question, that's going to be in the works. So, this next month is really going to be that stage of taking these recommendations, sitting with them and processing them and coming up with an actual step-by-step -step strategic plan. And that includes that engagement piece as well. Um, the first part, I already forget what the question was. <laughs> oh, the report is on the DEI page on the website. Um, we'll be putting links around with that QR code. It's been shared out It'll be shared out again through different town channels. Tell a friend to tell a friend, you know, <laughs> because if you've read it, pass it along. Um, as we know, one of the recommendations is that a communication problem. So here we are needing to work on it. <laughs> yeah, I also, I also wanted to add that we um, disseminated the um, community summary of the report to everyone who was a stakeholder um, in the stakeholder process. And so all of the folks that we spoke to um, have received it. Uh, Mark, if you have a question, we'll take one more question. Right. Well, it's a comment. I wanted to say you guys hit the nail on the head with improved environment. So, um, 
as a 30 year renter here, I find there's not a lot of community engagement. And, and, uh, it's, um, you know, maybe if you had more block parties, I mean, we've got the Feast of the East and the Town Day and the Heights has their own thing. It's, again, at the business district, but there's not a lot of outreach for people to really connect and know their neighbors. Yeah. Nice and chill, nice. They love the block party. Excellent. They are very good. I am seeing that we are kind of running out of questions. Is that right? Okay. So I, I, I'm just going to say a couple of things myself in closing. I don't know if you want to say anything. Um, one of the things that Arlington did, I think we are maybe unique in this community in the state, is we did a DEI training for all 400 town site employees. Schools have been doing their own, but we brought everybody in. Uh, we brought in department heads. We brought in police and fire. We brought in DPW workers. We brought in administrative and, and office staff. And we went through a lot of the issues around DEI. And I just want to make note, it's mentioned in the report here, of five goals that the town staff decided that they wanted to work on. I think they're worth mentioning tonight. We will create an inclusive town culture. Two, we will examine and improve our organizational structures and processes to align and advance DEI in our town. We will explore and test, reassess ways to increase DEI in all areas of town services. We will provide excellent, equitable town services. And finally, we will learn with each other and from each other in service to the Arlington community with continuous improvement. Um, so, uh, we're all at this now. This is not a one-stop shop. This is not something that's going to be decided overnight and taken care of. This is something where we need to continue to talk with each other, communicate with each other, listen to each other, that's a big part, uh, and work together. So, I am very excited about this. I very much want to thank Opportunity Consulting for the excellent work that you've done, for your straightforward recommendations, and I am looking forward to working with all 45,000 members of this community, with our staff, and with our visitors uh, to continue to develop diversity, equity, inclusion here in Arlington. Jill? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm going to then turn this Eric. over. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one of our select board members, Eric Hilden, is here. Give him a chance to say something, and then after that, I think we're going to turn this over to Len to close out the select board meeting. Thank you, Sandy. I'm going to try to keep my remarks brief because I think one of the best things that someone in position of power and privilege can do is listen. It's been really good to listen tonight, and I also want to express gratitude to Jill for the vision to do this, to our former town manager Adam Chapdelaine for the impetus, to Sandy for carrying that through to completion to the department heads here tonight who care enough about this to be here. My experience as the elected leader of the town, as a resident of the town, is that we have really good intentions about DEI. But intentions aren't good enough. And I think what I've heard tonight in the reading of the report is that we need to do a lot more listening. Because what happens when you ask the people that you say that you care about that you think you know what they need, and you might even speak for them as a person of privilege, is that you hear something different. I will tell you that some of the things in this report were hard to hear. We have a long way to go. Our intentions aren't going to bring us there. Our continued listening, our hard work, our accountability, I want that dashboard. I want to come back after an appropriate period of time and do another one of these to see where we come and hold ourselves accountable to that yardstick. Resources are the resources, and it's tough. But one thing I know about this town is that when we put our mind to something, we care about it, we make it happen. I will do my part, and I know that my colleagues on the board will do that part and future leaders. Um, but with that, I think I better uh, sit down and start listening some more. Thank you. 
Lynn, if you want to close out the meeting, I think we're yes, ready. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Um, Ms. Cooler. I'll, I'll just check to see if Ms. Mahal uh, wants to say anything. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and thank you to everyone. Opportunity Consulting and Jillian and Javi, and I'm going to stop naming people because I'm going to get in trouble because there's probably another 30 people I should be naming. Um, and I agree. The biggest thing that I've learned over the past couple of years that we've started to take baby steps in this process is, is really to listen and, and not to retort back because uh, that's sort of a natural instinct. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned is if I've heard something and I want to say something back to say, that's not true. We have this. I stopped from doing that because it doesn't matter if you have all the answers in government. If, if somebody is citing a need that they have or something that they feel that's missing or something that they feel that's not welcoming, it doesn't matter if that puzzle piece is already there. What matters is what they know. Um, and, and what my job is, is to listen and to learn from them to say, you know, what's the best way for me to help other people learn and know, uh, not just to stop citing ABCD. So um, that's all I have to say. I, I, I went a little bit longer, but I, I agree with my colleague in, in the chair that really listening is, is the big part of this. And I think you all wouldn't have done your job if you gave us a report and there weren't a couple of, of issues or I don't even know how many suggestions that didn't make us uncomfortable because, because that's what we want, um, because things can, can be better. Um, and I look forward to moving forward and hopefully making some of that happen. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. And the great part about being chair is that we, usually my colleagues have said it all and, 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 and repeating what they've said, but but I will repeat me what um, Ms. Gill um, said early on, and that is that it, it was a brave thing for the community to do, and, and I'm really proud of the community for it, for, um, for taking the step. I mean, it was something that uh, we had talked about doing, actually, when I was campaigning the first time, I mean, and so uh, we had the funds to do it, and we did it, and, uh, and a lot of the recommendations, I mean, I think there are things that we can can do from the recommendations, I me mean, that um, won't um, that we can do within our current budget. I mean, um, and other things we'll have to um, we'll have to figure out how to pay for it. And as um, we often say, I mean, um, I just reflect our values. I mean, um, and and uh, uh, you, you you get what you pay for. I mean, uh, and 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 also, I mean, if um if you don't pay for something, well, let me rephrase this. There's no such thing as a free lunch. I mean, um, so so either you pay for it or you pay the consequences of not having it. I mean, and so as a community, we will make some decisions, I mean, and decide on how to to go forward. Uh, and with respect to going forward, I will now take a motion from my colleague to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Helmet. Second. Second from Mrs. Mahan. And so I need to call a roll. And uh, so um, Mr. Helmet? Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, and thank you. You're welcome. And I, yes. Yeah, so thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Take care.